Glad you could join us. Now, in our first story, the Ghana National Association of Small Scale Miners has admonished licensed members to ensure their activities never prompt another government ban. Government lifted the ban on small scale mining after an announcement last week. The lifting of the 22 month ban is to save the environment from wanton destruction. The association says it is intensifying monitoring to ensure members abide by mining regulations. Secretary God Godwin Ama addressed a press conference in Kumase. We will take the opportunity to ask members to mine responsibly. If in the past you've not mined responsibly, then going forward, every member of association should work in accordance with the law, as the mining list dictates. Because we want Ghanaians to appreciate our work, and there should be clear, clear distinction between those who are members of the association and the way they work, and those who are working illegally. We want that distinction to be there. That's why we are telling our members. And we have our code of ethics. Once you don't go through, you don't work properly, you'll be sanctioned in accordance with the code. What measures? If you have your license, some of the illegalities is the law, it makes it very clear to every miner that you cannot undertake small scale mining with any legal, uh, any uh, uh, foreign national. Do you get it? The law is against it. So any member of the association, when you engage the services of any, especially the Chinese, we will take you out of our association. And then you'll be reported and the law will be applied. So we've cautioned all members that if anyone has been cleared to do a mine, it does not mean you should go to the old ways of involving the Chinese. Because you can see most of the devastation we are seeing even in our, uh, in, in our river bodies and the forest, you can see that about 90% are caused by this uh, forest. The monitoring is internally, what we've done is we put our lo uh, local and then the national um, monitors in place, which is led by our technical team. They will be going like a peer-to-peer -peer uh, review. In the mining communities, they will be going, they will be watching what they are doing, uh, telling them what they need to do to ensure that the mining is done properly. If you don't adhere to that, then the law has to take its course. We stay with mining and residents of mining communities in the Ashanti region anticipate economic activities to bounce back soon after governments lifted the ban on small-scale mining on Monday. Most of the once vibrant economic hubs became ghost towns during the period the ban was in place. Nana Sentiments had traveled to Amansia area to gauge the mood of the people and how registered miners geared up to return uh, to the pits. So on Friday, government announced the lifting of the ban on all small-scale mining. Now today is Monday, and we've visited some mining communities. Now what you've realized is that some artisanal miners have already started mining to make up for the losses they incurred during the 22-month long ban. Apart from cocoa and wahano, apart from cocoa farming, mining is our only way of life. So the ban on the small scale mining really affected us. But we are happy that the ban has been lifted at last. We are ready and willing to pay taxes. And the government must also monitor our activities to ensure we cover the pits. In some other mining communities, however, miners have started clearing bush path to make way for the long-awaited business to resume. <laughs> Where we are mining now is not close to any water body. We have dug wells to supply water to wash the gold. We mine responsibly 
and we are very friendly to the environment. We want government to issue us a license to operate and monitor our activities. This is our only source of livelihood, and we depend on this to feed our families. Others have begun greasing their rusty excavators and other earth moving equipment left idle during the long break. Artisans in some areas are assembling their tools at the sites. So, before the ban on small scale mining, this particular floor station was very vibrant. Most of the miners within this community come to buy fuel for the excavators here, but now it's dead. We are selling diesel and fuel, uh, diesel and uh, this thing, petrol. But as they, uh, they ban the small scale miners, all the work collapsed. So now as we hear that they have lifted the ban, we are trying to bring another good so that we can also do something small. So it is expected that this business and other businesses within this mining community will come back to life as the ban on small-scale mining has been lifted. My name is Nana Asensumaisa. Away from mining, the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice has been petitioned by the Northern Region-based NGO League of Youth over the death of a 16-year-old girl who died in the Tamale Teaching Hospital because her parents could not pay a processing fee of 108 Ghana cities. It took almost 12 hours before health officials at the Tamale Teaching Hospital attended to a 16-year-old student who needed blood transfusion. But it was too late. She died. The reason for the delay in attending to the 16-year-old was allegedly because her parents could not pay 108 CDs. Officials there called that figure a processing fee. Here's the story of Yakubu Amama, mother of first-year students of Ghana Senior High School, narrated as narrated uh, to join users Kwetinate in Tamil. Abdul Rahman Yusif lost his 16-year-old daughter. Abdul Rahama Shakina at the same hospital. The heavily built man's eyes well with tears as he tries to recount what happened two months ago. But the anger will not let him. That is, I wanted to kill one of them. What? Because why? Because the way the daughter is done here is no, it's paid me. On the 18th of September this year, he rushed his daughter to the Tamale Teaching Hospital. Doctors diagnosed her daughter as anemic and needed blood transfusion. They arrived at the hospital around 9.30 p.m. The health workers assured them they would carry this procedure in an hour but delayed the process of getting the blood till 3 a.m. and further delayed the transfusion till 9 a.m., almost 12 hours of waiting. This was because he said the doctors demanded 108 CDs before the blood would be transfused. But parents of the girl were told plainly that without money, they would not take care of her. Yakubu Amama is the mother and Nairate the painful event. We went to the hospital on the 18th September at West Hospital and they said they don't have place to admit the girl. So and the girl too need a uh, blood. So they don't have blood there. So they transfer us to TTH. The time that we, they are going to use the blood for the girl, they said that we should go in pay 1.8. That time my husband was not having money again. He slept with 20 CD on his pocket. And he said, he just told them that we don't have money again. So they should give us the medicine that they are going to use for the child. So that tomorrow he will bring them money. And they said that if we, we don't have money, then they will not do anything. The dying moment of her daughter still haunt her every night. If only she could get justice she would have a semblance of closure. When, when you, your daughter was dying, did you draw the attention of the nurses to, to her condition? I was not there. They didn't allow me to stand 
with the girl. When they come and clean the, uh, the hospital, they asked, her, they asked me to go out. So we went out and they cleaned all the hospital before we come back. When I came back around 9, going to 10, I didn't see my girl. And I was asking them, where is my girl, where is my girl? And somebody told me that they pushed the girl inside. And I went there. When I went there, I saw them uh, using uh, this in their blood. That time that they, they give her the blood and oxygen at once. So I went there and stand by my child and they say I should go out. And I went out again. And it appears there's very little effort by the authorities at the hospital to deal with the situation. Winusa of the League of Youth has petitioned Shrat, hoping the issue would be investigated. That is the case that we are pursuing. So we are pursuing Shrat to investigate, investigate that case so that those who are found culpable can be dealt with according to the law. What exactly are you asking Shrat to do uh, It was, I, we, what we are asking them to do is, it, in, it, in, it was on the part of them, it, it was a negligence on the part of the doctors because the case was brought there around 8 o'clock p.m. and only the blood to be given to the girl around 10 a.m. the following day. So it was negligence on the part of the doctors. We stay with the healthcare delivery system because the Ministry of Health says it will provide pontoon boats to island communities to improve access to health delivery in such areas. This was made after a US, the USAID today handed over a 25-passenger boat to the Ghana Health Service. This boat is expected to improve the quality of healthcare in these rural areas. Nancy MFA Jadosi was there and reports. About 36,000 people living along the 141 island communities in the Volta region have for years struggled to have access to quality health care as they often have unreliable and unsafe canoe to take them to the hospitals. Services provided to these communities like maternal health care are also limited. Deputy Director of the Public Health at the Volta Region, Dr. Yao Ofori Yabua, tells Joy News how expensive it is to provide health services to island communities. Very few health facilities on these islands. Uh, for most of them, for the people to assess the services, we have to provide outreach services uh, to these islands periodically. And, you know, it's very dangerous. The uh, health service, we don't have any functional uh, boat. Uh, so we have to depend on the uh, local canoes that people have uh, available. Look, we've lost people. Pregnant women have died, uh, children have died because we were unable to provide services to them. And therefore we are depriving Ghanaians who are on the islands of much needed services. And that's not fair. But there's good news. As the United States, through the USAID, has presented a 25-passenger pontoon boat to the Volta Regional Directorate of the Ghana Health Service to specifically enhance access to health care. Sharon Cromer is Mission Director for the USAID Ghana. We identified 141 uh, communities on island communities um, that needed access to uh, maternity and child health and, and other health care. And so we provided this uh, pontoon boat to reach those communities. After a brief handing over ceremony, the Deputy Health Minister Kingsley Abuajijidu notes the ministry is working to provide similar boats to other communities in other regions across the country. I think with this, they are now going to have needed access. And where we are standing, understand, is made for motorbike and things like that. So when you get to the island, the health workers who can use their motorbike to reach out because there's no, it's not reasonable to believe that all of them live just by the, the river. Some of them live a bit far from the river. So we need to get to them. Definitely, when I go back, I will brief my, my minister. And together, we shall find a way of adding more to augment the, the fleet so that the people on the islands too will have access to equitable and safe Okay. The pontoon, which is called Akpini Queen, was constructed by the Ghanaian under the Benlex Engineering and Marine Systems. Nancy MFA Jadosi, Joy News. Away from health, the Bolin Lana is calling on all residents of Dagbon um, 
their commitment to the peace process as well as logistical support, especially for the final day of his father's funeral rites. In an exclusive interview with head of our security desk, Gifty and Apia, the Bolinana said, so far, the processes have been peaceful and fulfilling, but the numbers expected on the last day need extra logistical support. Now, Gifty joins me with some updates, but first, let's take excerpts of a memorial lecture in the memory of the late Yana Mohamedou Abdullahi. Yeah. Yes, sir. So what has the Bonin Lana been telling you? Well, Daniel, I had that uh, exclusive access to speak to the Bonin Lana yesterday. Um, uh, what he said basically was that he's happy about what, how the process has gone on so far. But the key thing for each of them that I've spoken to is uh, for peace. And they're calling on all people, persons of all uh, the government to ensure that there is peace throughout the process so it ends and, uh, and, and, and beyond. But again, he said that looking at the numbers, so far, Daniel, I'm told that about 400 chiefs are in the Dagon area, and all of these people have to come to show their preparedness to the king anytime there is such a funeral. So we're expecting that they'll be coming, but that's a lot. He's saying right. that if you look at the number they've seen so far, the last day is going to be a, uh, an even greater number. Right. So they're expecting a lot more support in terms of uh, security. Indeed, they commend government for the presence of security by saying that they expect a lot more and uh, also for logistics in terms of health, you know, to have doctors around to help people just in case. And, uh, and he's calling on his subject, of course, people of Gabon to uh, come and support. Has he commented on this seemed um, split in the front of the Andani family, where one family says they were supposed to have been consulted and they've not been? Uh, Daniel, come again on that. I'm what asking if he, has cons he, if he has commented on this seeming split, uh, seemed split between in the front of the Andanis, where one side of the Andani family says they should have been consulted and they were not, and the other is going ahead with the process. Well, Daniel, at the moment, um, the focus really is on the funeral. The focus is right. on the funeral rites, and it's on the abudus because they are the ones who are performing their funeral rites, the funeral rites for their father at the moment. After them, in January, then there will be the funeral rites for the Andanis as well. And speaking of which, I have spoken to the, um, I have spoken to the Kapsafiana, of course, who is on the Andani side, and he told me they're waiting for their turn you know, to perform the funeral rites. He said, indeed, that he will not speak from camera. He will speak after the funeral right. Uh, right. But he also indicated that he had some concerns about media reportage that he was describing as inaccurate. But he said he will be referring back to the, uh, uh, referring back to the two for committee. And he also okay. raised concerns about the security presence. But that, Daniel, you know that government has always said that the presence of security is necessary because of uh, the need to maintain the peace that the people have been craving for over the years. It's been a very long and protracted uh, conflict. And so they're all hoping that this is the time for peace and this is the time everybody will conduct themselves uh, towards peace. What's happening right now is a memorial lecture. Uh, that's in honor of the late Yana Mahmoud Abdullah, whose okay. funeral rights have been performed. Uh, at the moment, who is speaking is Dr. Hudu Hussein. He's a lecturer at the University of Ghana Linguistics Department but uh, he's also a son of this land. And he's been speaking about building patriotic citizens and lessons from the makers of Dagon. And basically what he's been saying is that there is a key, the Yana played a key role in the development of Dagon. Religion, as they used religion to play a key role in the development of this place. And he's calling on people to just perform their duties as sons and daughters of the land and not necessarily to see themselves as royal people. He said that there are people who are not even royal people, but when there is a conflict, they get involved. But that even if there is a conflict at all, if okay. it is necessary at all, it mm. should just be focused on the royal, and people mm. should not fuel the conflict. He's actually basically con conscientizing people about the need to maintain peace, which is key. 
in all that's going on here. Daniel. Thank you. Gifty and Apia for that report. She's the head of our security desk here at Joy News. Now, Second Lady Samira Baumia has donated relief items to some widows who were displaced during this year's floods in the northern region. Heavy rainfall coupled with the opening of the Bagri Dam flooded several communities uh, dotted along the waterway, rendering hundreds of people homeless and destroying thousands of farmlands in the northern Upper East and Upper West regions. Martina Bogri reports. At the ceremony today at Yongdu, the second lady handed over food items and GTP wax prints to the widows as a way of cushioning them whilst efforts are being made to restore their lives back. My attention was drawn to a story that Abdul Karim Natoma of City FM did on widows who had been displaced by the floods. And we know the plight of widows already. And then to add to that, they were displaced by the floods. These are women who are struggling with young children, with their families. They couldn't have it any worse. So as a mother, as a daughter, I couldn't sit by unconcerned. So I, th I thought about what I could do to support these women. And I called a few friends of mine to help me so that we could bring some relief to our dear mothers. And Alhamdulillah, today is the day that has been destined that we can give the support to our women. This is Baomi outline some of the project her foundation has undertaken to support women and children. She urged the widows to ensure they educate their children because she believes education is the only tool that can eradicate poverty. I work tirelessly in support of women. At Samira Empowerment and Humanitarian Projects, we support women's health, we support women empowerment and literacy for our children. As part of our health initiatives, we are in East Gonja Municipality, which is now a municipality, and we are saving mothers by delivering birth kits to them so that they can have infection-free deliveries. And the results are incredible. So far, thousands of women have benefited from our intervention. mentioned earlier, we also have the library in a box project where we provide schools with, with libraries or those who do not have libraries, we give them a library in a box so that our children can read and be empowered. Now, English should no longer be recognized as a foreign language in Ghana, but a Ghanaian language. That's according to a professor of education at the University of Cape Coast, Professor Yao Afari Ankuma. Now, Prof argues the tonation, stress, and pronunciation of the English language in Ghana uh, makes it Ghanaian and should be proudly owned by the country as a native language. Prof Sankuma was speaking at his inaugural lecture at the University of Cape Coast. Richard Kojonyako has more. Years of research and fieldwork made the professor of education arrive at this conclusion. According to him, the language policy in Ghana should be able to address effective communication by the participants in the communication process. According to Professor Yao Afari Ankoma of the Institute for Educational Planning and Administration at the University of Cape Coast, the school language policy is only meant to prepare the young learner towards his ultimate goal of succeeding in examination and assessment and also to prepare them for all life's engagements. He is convinced the English language is no more a foreign language, but a Ghanaian language and should be seen as such. The English language has been recognized as the official language of the country. So English is not a foreign language today. English is not foreign. We are not saying that Canadian English is foreign. It's foreign because uh, Canada, they, that's not their language. And the American English is American English. The, the Indians, when they speak their English, it is their English. So Ghanaians, when we are speaking our English, it is our English. The English I am speaking is not spoken in UK. This is not their English. They don't use my donation. The donation I am using is Ghanaian. It's Ghanaian. So this is Ghanaian English. Oh. Uh -huh. I am speaking Ghanaian English. Because eventually, it is English that we will use for all our official transactions. It is English that we will learn the rest of our learning will take place in English. It is in English 
Then all kinds of assessment that will be done in. And it is in English that you'll be able to, um, to, to, to do big business and so on. The research sample teachers, parents, head teachers in the urban and rural parts of the country. In the research, teachers in the private schools were not in favor of the use of the local language at the basic level, while their counterparts in the public basic schools favored the use of the local language, but both realized the essence of the use of both the local language and the English language. The parents, too, had similar um, responses. Those in the rural areas opted for the use of the local language, the mother tongue, at the lower uh, levels, while those in the rural, uh, in the urban uh, one, opted for a message. Professor Yao Afariankuma is with the Institute of Educational Planning and Administration at the University of Cape Coast. Richard Kwejenya Akon, Joy News, Cape Coast. And I'm Daniel Dazi here in Accra. You want to stay with us on the Joy News today here on the Joy News channel uh, because coming up in business, Ghana's economy in the third quarter of the year grew by 7.4% compared to 8.7% recorded in the same period last year. Daryl Kwao has the details. 